I would say that now if we look at some of the recent evidence in physics and astrophysics concerning the, the fundamental laws of physics and some of the constants of nature, it's just the opposite. That the more we look at the structure of the universe, the more it looks like there is an intelligence behind it. And that's, that's the God theory, that there's intelligence behind the universe. And moreover, that that intelligence has a purpose and a motivation. And that motivation and purpose, I think, can be understood. And that's all part of the, the God theory that I've tried to present. Uh, what's the difference between the God theory and intelligent design? Oh, a very different thing. It's totally different. In intelligent design, you have a God who sort of micro-engineers life forms, who piddles, who, who fools around in the, the laboratory of life and, and uh, kind of inter intervenes with, uh, with evolution and does things that are outside of the customary run of nature. Um, mine has nothing to do with this. In, in my case, I'm assuming that there is an intelligence that created the Big Bang. The intelligence that made up the laws of physics that, that gave rise to the Big Bang, that governed a universe that, that is evolving since the Big Bang, but that doesn't uh, interfere with the evolutionary process. And so the, the view I present has got nothing to do with the kind of intelligent design that uh, you, 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 it's being posited now as a, an alternative to evolution, because I think, in fact, evolution is a key ingredient in the God theory. That evolution proves the God theory? That evolution is necessary in the God theory. Because I think what the, the intelligence behind the universe wants is to express itself in novel and new forms, novel and new ways. And to have that happen, you can't, you can't be microengineering life forms. You have to sort of set, set a universe going with certain laws and characteristics in place and then see what happens. And that seeing what happens happens through evolution. So in a sense, God needs Darwin to exercise his plan. I can put it that boldly. God needs Darwin. Uh, okay, so if you presented this theory to other scientists, why wouldn't they see that as science? Well, because they would say, where's the evidence? Where's the, where are the measurements made by the, the telescopes or the microscopes or the atom smashers? Where's the evidence? Now, in fact, I think there is evidence, but it's not the kind of hard evidence you find that would persuade scientists. The evidence I see for this comes from the, the mystical and transcendent experiences that people have had throughout the ages, where they actually experience these, these ideas that I talk about hypothetically and theoretically in my book. I would regard that as a form of evidence. But it's not the kind of evidence you can publish in the, uh, in the Astrophysical Journal or Nature or Science and, and call, it, call it science. Would you call that parascience? I'm not sure I'd like to put that term on it, because para kind of has negative implications, too. Maybe not legitimately so, but it, it has picked that up. Um, I would call it soft scientific evidence anecdotal evidence, but if you have well, enough anecdotal evidence, you, you get to have some confidence that the evidence does point somewhere. What's the difference between parascience and science? Well, you know, I'm not actually sure, because I don't know what the word parascience literally means, other than something that is sort of, sort of, well, tell me, I guess, what does it mean well, to you? Well, as I've heard it described, just the idea that it, is, it isn't science as can be proven, but it is around science. It is built around scientific principles, but can't ultimately be proven as a, as a pure scientific discipline. I guess I would go for that. I'm hoping that in the future, science evolves in a way that it would accommodate things like that, because I think that we're going to discover in the years ahead that there are areas of our human... Um, our human life, our human abilities, uh, our human existence, that simply are not going to be explainable in terms of the science we have today. That specifically the, the role and nature of consciousness in our lives and in the universe is something that we're not investigating in the right direction these days in terms of science and neuroscience and so on, but rather that we're overlooking some of the fundamental aspects of consciousness that simply haven't found a place yet in the scientific method. Uh, we, yeah, and I think that that actually points back to that definition problem again, because uh, the first person who, who ever brought that uh, to my attention was somebody who is a uh, professor emeritus at the University of Chicago uh, and a radio personality on his own right. But he said that uh, he said psychiatry is put into the category of science, but he said it's really not. He said it's really parascience. He said we can't you can't prove it. You know, you can't prove psychiatry or even psychology like you can science but he said you know there's enough he said sort of there's this big anecdotal uh glacier that sort of has moved in the subject and it's enough to be able to sort of convince people that it's science but it may not be because it it deals with the vagaries of consciousness and we can't really quite 
fully comprehend co- consciousness, can we? No, I don't think so. In fact, I'm thinking that we have it, in a sense, we have it backwards scientifically. We keep looking for how, how somehow consciousness emerges from brain processes. It's always regarded scientifically as kind of an emergent phenomenon. And I think that's actually backwards. It seems to me, and in the context of the God theory, I, I tend to believe that it's consciousness that is the fundamental aspect of reality. In fact, all probably 80 years ago, Sir James Jeans, who was one of the most prominent astrophysicists of the last century, wrote that he thought that the universe begins to look more like a great thought than like a great machine. And that's my view, too, that the universe, the, the basis of the universe, the basis of everything in, the, in it that we consider to be physical reality, is really a thought of an intelligence, that the ideas of this intelligence are the laws of nature that make the universe possible, and that ultimately everything comes down to consciousness. So the universe really is more a thought than a machine. But in a way, doesn't this mean that as an astrophysicist, uh, Dr. Haish, that you are circling back to the earliest astrophysicists who are also theologians? Well, I suppose so. Another one that I, I really am struck by is Sir Arthur Eddington. He was the one who made Einstein famous back in 1919, because he was the one who led the Eclipse Expedition that measured the bending of starlight that startled the world that made Einstein famous for his theory of gravitation. And Eddington, too, was a mystic. In fact, he wrote about this when he published a book in 1929 called Science in the Unseen World. He actually believed that there was another reality, other realities beyond the physical, which, of course, would surprise no one in, in, the, in the religious or spiritual arena, but which certainly contradicts what most, most scientists seem to think is the, uh, the basis of reality. Although now, with string theory and membrane theory being the hot topics in physics, uh, there's lots of talk about other universes and other dimensions and other realms. So it's not that, that far-fetched, really, to think that there are unseen worlds that the spiritual traditions have talked about for centuries. Right. Yeah, I am reminded of a quote from a, a Muslim mystic that uh, there is a world within this world and in every glass of water an ocean. <laughs> <laughs> and I've always nice. loved that. Uh, but, okay, so in a way, it almost sounds like science is limited too much by scientists, that, that be, the scientists are ruining science. <laughs> the, well, the, what they're doing, I think, is not everybody, of course. I mean, my, right. a lot of my colleagues are good guys. Right. But what some scientists are doing is, is worshipping not at the, uh, not doing science, but worshipping at the altar of scientism. If you take the, the view of science that it is uh, something that encompasses everything, every possible reality, rather than simply the physical reality that's very good at studying, then you've crossed the border from being a scientist to being a believer in scientism. The scientism then becomes a dogma that's on the same level as, as the religious dogmas are, with the same... Uh, perhaps unfortunate unfortunate consequences of a dogma that uh, I think is wrong-headed. Well, you know, I, I, I once learned in cemetery, seminary that uh, uh, yesterday's heresies are today's orthodoxies, <laughs> and, that, and that's pretty much true for science. Right. In fact, that's sort of one of the mottos of this uh, Society for Scientific Exploration I was talking about. We oftentimes discuss the, the heresies of today being the subjects that we publish in the, the Journal of Scientific Exploration, becoming the things that you find in the mainstream journals, hopefully in a decade or two, maybe less. Yeah, maybe less. Uh, and, uh, and so the God theory you, you, that you offer allows for somebody to approach the subject of a divine intelligence through purely scientific means. And I, I want you, you mentioned that there were a couple of, um, a couple of pieces of anecdotal evidence that fit together for you that are uh, convincing. And I, I'd like you, if you could, to go over some of those anecdotal pieces coming up. Are you good with that? It's fine. Dr. Bernard Haish, The God Theory, his book from a couple years ago, plus a new one in between. And and then we'll talk about this. And, and then I, I do want to get to the principles of inertia, which I'm fascinated with, and how this could lead to new propulsion systems. But as you can hear, you know, this is a guy who is firmly rooted in science. So how can we imagine that there's an invisible divine hand at work in the universe? Uh, we'll find out what those, um, what evidence A, B, C, what the items are next on Coast to Coast AM. This is Ian Punnett. We're talking with Dr. Bernard Haish, astrophysicist, about his God theory. And we'll get back to the, the, the best evidence that he can present for why this is true. Also, uh, we'll, uh, we'll explore some of the other scientific theories 
that Dr. Hayes is responsible for next on Coast to Coast AM. This is Ian Punnett.